It's Big Brew Day 2020 and I'm doing a modified recipe of something I've done on this channel before because we're still in stay at home orders and I gotta use what I got. So that's what we're doing right now. Hey everyone, it is Matt Big Monster Brewing and it is May 2nd, 2020. It's Big Brew Day. It's a day I definitely want to participate in and I've also wanted to get these videos going on the channel again. So both seem like a perfect match a pair I don't know what you want to call it like I said in the opening we're still in the midst of this dealing with this COVID uh, pandemic we're at whatever your area is calling it lockdown stay at home uh, shelter in place quarantine all that we're in the middle of it here too in Orlando so I don't have the ingredients for the official big brew day recipe but I use that as an inspiration for what I'm going to brew today so I dug up what I had on hand, looked at what I could make, and I had enough ingredients to do a altered version of what was the Og Monster, which is actually one of the last videos I posted on here. So it's kind of funny I'm coming back with a version of that. But it's called a Wigo Monster. It is a what I got on hand monster. It's gonna be a hazy IPA. It's gonna be using the Imperial Juice Yeast, which lends a lot to that. I also had a lot of flaked oats, which will help to the appearance as well. And it should be pretty uh, pretty sessionable when all said and done, but none of that's gonna happen unless I brew beer. So let's get started. Before we really get into it, let me introduce you to my, well, my little friend, actually. Well, go, I'll go ahead and make the joke. I, since I last saw you all, I went ahead and purchased the Anvil Foundry. This is the six and a half gallon, as you can probably tell from its short stature. This is, well, there's a lot I'm gonna say about it. I'll talk about why I went with the small one first. One, because I'm running, if you can see, I'm running off of, that's regular one, 110 voltage, so I can only use one heating element. With this batch size, it's perfect. It gets to a nice boil, not as rolling as I did with gas, but I'm rolling enough for my comfort level. It's also, probably the perfect amount of beer because one gallon you can only get I've been only getting about eight bottles out of with this two and a half gallons I can keg it up I can put it in crowlers I can bottle it if I want or I can just put it on tap and it is just it's it's been it's a perfect compromise between my five gallon system and my one gallon system and you can probably see from all the water spots it's been well used it's clean don't worry the inside where it really matters is super clean but the I've been using this a lot. I've been using it once a week since this shelter in place has started. And I've been using it even more often since then. And I bought it saying it was gonna supplement my five gallon system. I haven't broken out my five gallon system since I had this, so I'm not sure what I'm gonna do about that. But if you're not familiar with it, it's super simple. It's an all in one in a sense. I mean, there's a couple things. I'm, I do sparge, I heat up water on another heating source to sparge a gallon of uh, water over everything and I do ferment in another vessel so as far as I guess the, it's a mash and boil on one but as you can see I got the recycling option the water's recycling right now so we're heating up the strike temperature I've got the strike temperature set to 152 and I turned it on I don't know five ten minutes ago it was about 102 because I'm using warm tap water hot tap water so it's rising pretty quick and what else can I say about it? Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'll talk more about it as we go because we're going to be using it all day. And I did mention tap water. Not that, <laughs> like that you can see that that's tap water. I'm using tap water because um, I don't need to go out to buy spring water or even RO water when I can just put some candom tablets in here, burn off the chloramine and, and uh, chloride if there's any in it and then add the minerals I need. I've already tested the water. I know what its profile is, so. Yeah, little extra additives, but I don't have to go out and I don't have to bother anybody, so. Speaking of that, I do need to get the minerals together and dump them in the water before this comes up to strike temperature. With running city tap water, it's actually pretty surprising how close the profile is to what I need for most of my beers, but in this case, we do need to do a little alteration, one that I actually have to do according to the calculations. I need to add some Epsom salt. I need 1.8 grams. So let me do that over the camera. There we go. That's, that's close enough. 1.86 if it's not coming out on camera. And my profile in Beersmith doesn't say I have to do this, but I do this for my own peace of mind, especially when I'm doing an IPA. 
I'm gonna add another gram of gypsum just to make sure we kind of bring out the profile of those hops because it's kind of the trademark of that style. So let me get a gram-ish in there. There, ooh, that says one gram, I'm gonna stop. All right, I'm gonna put these in the water, let them circulate and wait for that mash temperature to get up to temp. All right, let's talk about the grain bill we got going. I got a decent amount of two row. We got four pounds of two row. I'm supplementing that with two pounds of Pilsner malt because I need to hold my two row for some other things that I'm going to be doing during this whole shelter in place. Half a pound of flaked oats, four ounces of aromatic malts, and four ounces of my new favorite malt to play with, golden naked oats. So we're gonna mix all those together except the flaked oats and get them milled. Got the grains milled very nicely. In fact, there's the dust on my hand. Try to get that in there because that's actually the starches we want to convert. And I still got my oats set aside here. So I'm going to just kind of stick them. Actually, eh, I could dump them. There's really no harm in dumping them in now. So there we go. And then last but not least, what I use when I use the foundry, I got about two ounces of rice hulls because I have my mill set. I'm also doing one gallon batches during all this. I have my mill set just perfectly to just mill everything once for the mash in the bag and then to be to get some decent efficiency out of the foundry but when i kind of cross that six pound of grain area i get some stuck sparges and i don't want to keep changing my mill the gap on my mill every time when i switch between the two so i compromise and i put in just this little bit of rice holes that gives enough space between all the grains and everything to keep that recirculation flowing so it's a perfect compromise so let's get this well we can't put it in the water till it's up to strike but you're not got to wait you're just gonna see that next all right we're at mash temperature and i'm gonna mention this because you might have this question if you've looked at the instruction manual for the foundry why did i set it for the exact mash temperature not a little higher to compensate for grain temperature loss when i mash in because i found with this unit now when i do that i don't have any temperature loss or if i do it's very minor, it's like a degree or two. I don't think it's been any more than that. And I would rather wait just a couple minutes for it to reach temperature again, rather than wait possibly 10 to 15 minutes for it to be too high in conversion to start at the wrong temperature, which is, I found it takes a lot uh, less time to heat up than it does cool down. So I just set it for the mash temperature I need, and then I mash in, I say, four out of five times it just holds that temperature and if not i only increase my brew day by five minutes max so this is the point of the video where i didn't have my mic recorder going so i'm going to do a voiceover and try to remember everything i said in this video so if you haven't figured it out we're about to mash in i'm picking up the grains i mixed up the oats best i could with my hands but tried to keep the starches in the container and get them into the strike water like I'm doing now. Um, pouring about half in, and I probably said something really clever here. It would have been worth repeating if I could remember, but I can't. Now I'm talking about the mash paddle that I'm picking up that was made for me by Quint from Trailer Pod Boys. It's probably the greatest mash paddle I've ever used. I've used it for uh, two, three years now. It is cutting through all of that mash, any dough balls, if any, just get shredded by that thing. Absolutely love it. And cleaning that up. To, oh, tap, 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 tap. Should have put sound effects in. And now I'm going to add some rice holes. There we go. Way more than I intended to. But they're there. So I'm stirring those in too. Slosh, 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 slosh. Dribble, slosh. Mixy sound, slosh. And tap, 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 tap. tap and then repeat and put the other half of the grains in and there we go and this is where just to mention if you get one of these devices this is where you would really get dough balls if you're going to get them in fact we're going to see some here but again this mash paddle just cuts through them so i'm kind of just pushing in the lumps of grain to get them in the water and then just letting the mash paddle do what it does best and just eviscerate those things i love this thing i mean i think i could probably dump the entire uh, grist in there at once and get it stirred out in less than a minute with that thing. So that's about it. I'm going to add some more rice hulls, cover this up, turn on the recirculation pump and let it mash for an hour. 
Now we are matched in and recirculating, and I'm going to keep an eye on that color. It's going to change a little bit, but not a lot. There's not a lot of specialty molds in here to change that color. We're not going to get past yellow. It's not yellow yet, but we're going to get a little yellow on that, and, and that's about as far as it'll go. So I'm going to let this rest for an hour, stir it up about every 15 minutes, and while we wait, we're going to go get our hops ready for the boil. These hop additions are relatively simple in schedule. We're going to do a first... A wart hop so we'll talk more about that when we get to it and then we're literally not adding anything to the boil this time well we're going to add yeast nutrients and some clarifiers but not any hops we're going to do just a whirlpool in the end so like i said not a complicated schedule but hopefully the combination of the hops will actually be a little more complex but first i need to turn my scale back on and i'm going to get this first wart hops together and those are columbus now in og monster they're a galaxy so I compromised. I know Columbus and Galaxy don't have the same flavor profile, but they have a similar alpha acid. And that's the important part for this layer of hops in this beer, I should say. It's not always the case with every beer. But for this beer, we just want the, the bitterness, the acids, the preservative qualities, that kind of thing. We're not really worried about the fruity, tropical kind of taste that Galaxy brings. We just want the bittering in the acids and that is 24.8 or 0.248 let me get one more in there to i'd rather have more than less in this part okay 0.251 ounces so there we go we're good with the bittering hops now for the whirlpool hops we have an even amount of three hops and these are almost the same as og monster i only had to make one substitution we still have mandarinia mandarina bavaria still have nelson savon or savon um, the compromise I had to make was replace, I believe, Citra, yes, yeah, Citra, with Idaho Gem. I do have some Citra on hand, but not much, and in this current uh, the, the period of time that we're in, I want to save those for another brew later. So I'm going to go with something new, something that's in that realm of flavor, an Idaho Gem. So we'll see how that turns out. So I need to weigh out a half ounce each of those. All right, got everything at the ready here. I'll start with Mandarina Bavaria. Again, a half an ounce, so... Whew. Hmm. There, let's see. I keep pouring when we're close. Oh, I probably overdid it. Nope. Oh, we're still off there. All that is still not there. Ah, that was too much. I could feel it. Actually, not all that much too much, but... Let's try to get it close so that if we need to repeat this recipe, we know what we're working with. 0.52, I'll take it. I got a bigger cup to put all these in because no sense in wasting these cups and having to go out and buy more in this, again, period of time. So, we set the tear. Let's see, here we go as our Nelson Savoin. I am never going to say that second word right because I'm not a wine guy. All right, that smell really good actually. Let's see, almost there. Uh, there we go, 0.501. So, dump those in there, shake out the, there was a lot of hop dust in that one, which I actually don't mind for a whirlpool at all. All right, tear this out again. And Idaho Gem, Whoop, there you go. Idaho Gem, I wanted to show you, I never opened this. That's another reason I wanted to try this. Had this for a while, I had it for an experiment for a brew club, but of course we haven't had any meetings, so I'm gonna crack it open for this. Ooh, I just took a nice smell of it. That is there, frighteningly sweet, like in a good way, I wasn't expecting that, so I'm kind of excited about <laughs> using these now. I'm also gonna use all three of these in the dry hops, which we'll talk about much later. So, we're almost at five. There we go, 0.506. Good enough, put those in there as well. And whoops, and there's our Whirlpool addition. Might not look like much if you're used to five and 10 gallons, but remember this is two and a half gallons. That's, that's, a, that's a sizable amount for a dry hop, for that amount of uh, beer. And of course, here's Andy the Brewmutt to help us, she always helps. You look at the camera? Sorta. All right, go help. And there she is, helping. All right, got all the additions ready. These are, we just went through these. That's the first word hop. Here's the yeast nutrients, and then here's the whirlpool. 
and I'm taking a terrible shot of that. And I did mention a clarifier earlier, and that was a mistake. That was just me saying it out of habit because it's a hazy IPA, and putting a clarifier in is going to be counterproductive. So we're not doing that. I'm about to stir up the mash, so let's look at that color change. I think there's a little yellow hue. I actually can see it more on the on the recycling plate. I think. I think. Well. I'm not really sure. Like I said, it is not going to be a robust color. In fact, we're probably not going to see much of a yellow hue to it until after the boil and then the fermenter, to be honest. But I do need to stir this up, so let me get that out of the way. All right, stirring is pretty straightforward, and the instructions do say just to rake the top quarter. I, I kind of do the whole thing, and I've not had a problem. I might have to maybe, well, I was going to say, maybe recirculate a little more to clear it, but I really don't. I haven't had a problem stirring it from the bottom, but I don't stir real aggressively either, and that might be uh, helping as well. But that was it. What I just did was, that's all you gotta do. Three times during this has been perfect for hitting my numbers and everything else. Annie, I don't know how I get through these grueling brew days without your assistance. We're almost done at the mash, and there's one thing I wanted to talk about with this system that I hadn't yet. In fact, actually, since we're on the subject of the pump, I blew the lead on that. Let's look at the color quick. And, all right, I, I can definitely see some yellow, but not a whole lot. And uh, it's actually clearer than I wanted because I want this to be hazy. Maybe when I stir it up and remove the grist, it'll be a little uh, more cloudy. I mean, it's cloudy, but I want it to be more. Actually, once I do the hops in the yeast, eh, I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself there. I'm roaring for nothing. But I want to talk about the pump. This has been running the whole time. And now, granted, I'm wearing a lavalier mic, so it's hard to hear anything that's that's not near it. I'm going to try to get near it while keeping the camera in range. I don't know if you... Well, you shouldn't have heard anything. If anything, now you're hearing the fan turn on for the heating elements. This pump is ridiculously quiet, and it's still... It's running. So me leaning up on it with my lav mic and you hearing nothing is no trick. That's how quiet this pump is. I'm not sure what flow rate it has, but if I can test it on the bigger system, if I ever use it again, I may replace my current pumps with this because I love how quiet this is. The dog next door isn't so quiet, but that's another story. Got a few things to do on this step, so I'm going to keep the camera there in the tripod and try to walk through this, walk and talk through this best I can. First and foremost, let's turn off the pump as we don't want to lift the lid and disconnect everything with the pump running. And I'm gonna close this valve too, because we're gonna disconnect the pump. We're done with the pump in this particular batch of beer. So, actually done with the lid as well. Set that over here, you can see. I'd love to say it's nice and organized, but it's not, it's a mess. We're also done with this. We're obviously going to clean it. But I'll spare you that boring stuff. So we're done with this. I'm gonna let that drain into this bucket. See, I've got the valve over the bucket so I don't make too much of a mess. And disconnect this hose and let that drain in. In fact, it's gonna take most of what's still in the pump through. I'm just gonna let that dangle. <laughs> I said dangle. I'll let that sit there so it drips and we're gonna get the mash basket out but we're not going to completely remove it from the system yet because we're gonna sparge. So, we do have this handy dandy ring, which can be trying sometimes, but I'm getting a little better at it. I'm going to straighten out the whole unit here, and the valve is still over the bucket, so we're good there. This bar is a little warm. It's been warming up at almost 100, well, 152 degrees. We got the number. Little trick, cool little trick here. We're going to have these little feet platforms that we want to rest on these bars. This bar is directly over two of them, so you know where two are, and we use this bar to line up where we want it. So first we need to clear the ring, and this is where I struggle a little, and not so bad. And we're going to lift and turn and let it rest. Let me take a quick look. Yep, we're on all four sides. I did lie, not on purpose. We are still using this. Hopefully it's in camera. Whoop, dripping a little bit from the condensation. We're gonna use the plate to sparge, and I'll show you just one, not even one step, just one round of it. Oop, kind of a loud round. Behind me, there's a uh, one gallon of water that I heated up to 172. It's now cooled down to 168. It's perfect. 
So I just use this measuring cup and I pour, I try just to just get one complete layer of water over this plate. No more, could be less, but no more because then you start running water down these seams and I don't know if you, this is on camera, but the holes in the handle and you're wasting that hot water that you could be using to rinse those sugars off and increase your efficiency and just get more uh, fermentable sugars, higher gravity, depending on what you're aiming for, of course. This is how, these are the best results I found from my process. Your mileage may vary. And it seems like an extra step and manual step for something that was might be described as an all-in-one automated system, but I don't mind. This whole brew day is gonna be four hours. That is it, I'll be done by lunch. And in two weeks, I'll have what is hopefully some fantastic beer. So I don't mind this part of the process. Again, you do what you do. This is what I do. Sparge is done. I am gonna let it drain for like another five minutes or so. I disconnected the hoses. There's the extra wart. I'll pour that back in. I'm actually gonna let this basket, whoop, whoop, this basket rest on that bucket as I bring everything up to a boil. I have set the unit to boil. I probably should have shown that, but this is not anywhere near the last time that this Anvil Foundry is going to be seen. In fact, I think it's going to be exclusively seen on this channel after this. And I would, by practice or by, what well, would the tradition, add the first wart hops now, but I'm not going to because I have another step that I do. Again, it's not a normal practice for this that I do that might adversely affect doing that. And you're gonna see that next and it's gonna make a lot of people unhappy. But again, this is what I do. Your mileage may vary. I can't believe I just said that. Okay, this is the point, this is the thing. This is the one thing that I do that I don't see many other people do, if anyone else do does do. Lost my train of thought there. And I know this amount of work is going to aggravate some people with a foundry. There's definitely better ways to do this. A lot of people are probably wondering why I even bother to do this, but it's what I do. And I'm not telling anyone you have to do this. So why are you getting upset? Why am I getting upset at people that haven't actually said anything? I don't know. That's my, that's my own issue to work through. But anyway, so I mentioned when we milled the grains, I have a specific gap on my mill that accommodates both this, this brewing and my one gallon brewing. And because of that, the grinds are a little fine, a little more fine, finer, finer. They're a little finer than they probably should be. Uh, and so I got a lot of, in fact, I'll just show you, getting a lot of uh, husks and other particles in there that I want out. I don't want to boil that because we'll get some off flavors, particularly, particularly with the husk pieces. We're gonna get some tannins. So what I do, and again, this is just me, I give it a good stir around. Actually, I even get that this handle's long enough for me to get down to bottom. Give it a get everything in suspension. Give it a good scoop. Slam it out, and then I do that again. I do it at this point now 20 times. That seems to be the sweet spot. It's also good for my OCD. I get the count, I get a finish point, and get those pieces of particulates I don't want in there. Again, this is a me practice. So maybe uh, there's a better way. I know a lot of people put a brew bag inside their basket. I prefer to do this and clean and clean these two items than, than wash out another ba uh, uh, brew um, bag, I should say. I don't know if I said bag because I do use one for my one gallons and washing those bags is not fun. I'd much rather do this 20 times and clean these and clean a brew bag on this brew day. That's the compromise I made. And well, that's it, I need to get to do that. So you don't need to watch the other 18 of those. I'll just take care of those myself. I got that sweet wart pretty well cleared out. I'm about to do the uh, first wart hops now. What, let's see the temperature we're at. We're 162, that's not, that's all right. I, I can live with that. But I do wanna get a pre-boil gravity reading, so. Have my measuring spoons out for the, uh, what do you call it, the yeast nutrients later. So let's see what we got here. We got 145, the goal was 148, that's not bad. I have noticed that since turning to tap water during all this, my numbers vary. And I did measure the, the um, I did a, a water profile from my tap water uh, when this all started, so in March. It's now, well, May 2nd, it's big brew day. So it, it, it's undoubtedly changed. It's the, uh, 
the runoff, the rain. We hadn't had rain for months before that. We've had rain now. So even with the city water treatment, it's gonna change. So I have noticed a variation in my starting grab, not only my pre-boil, but my starting gravities, but my finishing gravities have been pretty good. So that's just, that's just a minor uh, inconvenience during what we're going through. I should just be happy I have what I have on hand, the brew. And let's talk about brewing some more. Here is the first wart hops. That is the Columbus, the quarter ounce of Columbus. There we go, as simple as that. And as if it's coming up on camera, you can probably see the pellets basically disintegrated or are disintegrating. I didn't want to pull out all the leafy matter until all the oils and everything is isomerized by doing the skimming I was doing with the uh, strainer, just last clip. So hopefully that explains what I didn't explain about not putting the first uh, word hop in there. I need a script for this because I don't even know what I'm talking about at this point. We're at the boil now, and this is what I was talking about, how, I mean, we got a nice ripple. Maybe you'd even call it a little bit of a roll. It's not quite the rolling boil. If you see my other videos, like in the one gallon, or even the, the, the I think I did one five gallon batch video, I kind of get a little more than that, like just another notch up, but this is what you get at 110, it's not bad. It's not bad, 110 volts. Uh, there's about, what do we see, four gallons of liquid in there? That's not terrible. Um, if I ever get an opportunity to wire 240 something close to here or my garage, because I can of course do this inside since there's no exhaust from propane, I will, but I'm happy with this. And I've gotten some really good results and I've adjusted my brewing process for this particular device. And like I said, you, you can't complain with the end results when you're happy that you have drinkable beer at the end. That's, that's my theory, so. Now, all I have to do for this part of the boil is set a timer because we're not adding anything until the whirlpool hops. Well, we're adding yeast nutrients, so there's that. That's not for another 50 minutes. All right, we can't have a brew day without some beer, and the beer I have today is extremely apropos. I had to set the camera on a tripod because I need, let's say two hands, but I need three hands. But let me talk about the beer. Let's see if that rings any bells anybody. The name, well, it's not a name, the uh, uh, description, barley wine. This is the beer I made for Big Brew Day last year, which was, I believe, May 4th, 2019. So this beer is 364 days old. And that, that math is right, because remember, 2020 was a leap year, because 2020 wasn't messed up enough already. First time I'm drinking this a whole year. I don't even really remember much about this. I do remember there's a ton of rye in it, because it was super thick and goopy to get in the fermenter. I think there's black sugar in it. Apart from that, I, I don't remember. It's gotta have some caramel malts. It's gotta have some kind of base, probably two row. I honestly don't remember and I didn't go back and watch the video because I kinda wanna be surprised. So for the Big Brew Day toast, I've got 2019's Big Brew Day beer for the very first time. So kind of excited to try this as well as apprehensive. So let's see if we got a hiss. This was bottle conditioned. All right, we're gonna have some kind of carbonation. Not a whole lot rolling off the top. I'm gonna put that in my pocket so I have a free hand. All right, I'm gonna gently pour, because again, it's bottle condition. We're gonna have some goop at the bottom. Oh, that's a pretty decent color. And there's, it's not forming a head, but I can see some carbonation in it. I think I measured out corn sugar. I didn't use a carbonation cap uh, or drop. I measured out corn sugar to have a very light fermentation. Color is gorgeous. I'll put this bottle down. So you can see the color, it's actually quite clear, which I'd hope so, it hasn't moved for a year. The aroma is very <laughs> rich. Oh man, there's a lot on the nose there. A lot of caramel, a bit of currant, a little raisin, maybe prune, more, I think more raisin, more sweet raisin, and alcohol. I can smell the alcohol coming off of this too. Not, not super strong, not, not boozy, but I can smell the alcohol. And the only thing left to do is take a taste. This is where I'm a little worried with all that rye. There's a bit of a rye bite to it. And I don't mean in a spicy burning way. Like there's a, like that rye richness. If you've used rye a lot, if there's, there's a, I think it's Renegade Rye IPA by Sierra Nevada, which is a perfect example of what rye can do to a beer. There's it, it's in there, but it's not as strong as I thought it was going to be. It's actually more fruity 
I expected. There's some wine character to it, too. There's a little bit of sherry. Like, not quite super sour sherry, but a little bit of sherry to it. I'm just getting a ton of, like, raisin prune. Um, maybe some kind of stone fruit, like a little bit of a... Um, not peach, but pear. If pear is a stone fruit, I'm not sure if that's considered a stone fruit. But that would be the other fruit that's not a raisin, currant, or, or prune. I'm like... I, I realize I just I'm looking at the screen now rather than the camera and realize I'm wincing. I'm not wincing because it's bad. I'm wincing because it's an unexpectedly complex for the brewing I was doing a year ago compared to now. I wouldn't expect this to be as rich as it was, especially for the first barley wine. If it was a third or fourth iteration of another beer, maybe. But I'm surprised how how complex this is turning out and drinkable. It's just a big thing. And I don't, don't know what the ABV is, but I was building it as a barley wine style, so this could be very dangerous if this gets out of hand too quick. And I still got seven bottles of it. Well, anyway. Hey, cheers. You know what? I never did give a toast with this, so we do it now. Cheers to Big Brew Day. Even more so, cheers to everyone that is doing their best to get through what we're going through. Either it's watching this video, taking up a hobby, brewing your beer, playing some board games, watching TV, whatever you got to do to do. Cheers to you and cheers to Big Brew Day. Well, the only exciting thing that happened since the last video is that I did put the immersion chiller in to sanitize it. And in another five minutes, I'll put the yeast nutrients in. But uh, this is the one that came with the unit. It's stainless steel. It's got some good surface area. There's one I do want to buy by Jaded. It's kind of the all-in-one unit equivalent of the Hydra I have, but this has actually been working better than I expected when I thought I was going to go ahead and just buy that one, so I might not. And we'll see it in action shortly. Um, well, eventually in this video. Actually, it'll be shortly for you. For me, it's still eh, a little bit of ways. So this is basically the same shot as before, but with a refractometer in the shot just to differentiate it which I, I just use this to take a gravity reading and it's low it's it's quite low it's like seven points off and that is something i can uh fix sort of kind of or do something to adjust especially considering we've had no boil additions there's no hop change here i'm gonna change the angle so it looks like we're doing something different there's no uh there's no other hops in there except those first ward hops and they're not gonna get like even more bitter necessarily well I mean, i guess technically but I'm going to, you know, I'll change the angle again. I'm going to extend this boil time to 90 minutes, which I kind of wanted to do anyway with using the Pilsner malt. So I'm happy about that decision. I should get closer to my target gravity. And I got that 30 minutes I kind of wanted to do to drive off the DMS. So that is it. I'll be back with more after this. I just finished my absolutely fantastic lunch and beer from Cyborg Brewing. And I wanted to make sure I filmed this. You know, the moment we've all been waiting for. The yeast nutrients going into the boil. And there it is. We're in the last minute of this boil. And I'm going to start preparing for the Whirlpool. And I will tell you, this is not something I've completely dialed in yet. So this is going to be yet another way of doing it. Although you haven't seen the other ways. But first, let's set... The temperature for 180. That's the target I want. 180 ish. And I'll leave the power. I haven't turned the power down to 80%, but I'm going to leave it at 100 this time. And now, what else I have to do? As you can see, the chiller has a bucket of water. That water is 83 degrees. I'm just going to run this for like some pulses for about a minute to try to drop all the temperature of this ward down to the 180 range that's been my struggle that's been what's tough i've dropped it way too low i just letting it drop on its own like we are right now technically it's not super fast we're at well 209 that's what it was almost immediately when i changed the temperature so it's i'm trying to find that middle ground so this is new territory for me this might not be what we see in the future this is only the third time i whirlpool hopped in the foundry so let's start um i'll show you what else i got here inside there the sub pump and that's hooked up to a foot pedal thank you to larry at barbecue and brews i think is the youtube channel name not like he has any idea who i am but for even pointing out that they existed it's been perfect so i'm going to start up the pump actually 
Let me get my spoon ready in the middle. I find that's easiest for while pull pulling. I can actually stir. Yeah, that's hot. I didn't burn myself, but that was hot. So let me start off the pump. And I'm gonna stir for, I don't know, I'm gonna look at the timer here, 10 seconds. And, oh, that's, I'm counting and trying to talk at the same time. I will give you a little hint, uh, a preview. I'm gonna talk about this water temperature later, which I know, I know you all just said, that's awesome. I cannot wait to talk about water temperature. But <laughs> in the meantime, let's see, we've already dropped, uh, Oh, eight degrees. So I'm going to stop for a little bit. I'm going to stir and I'm going to keep doing that. That was longer than I probably would do if I'm not talking. I'd probably actually let it go like about 10, 15 seconds. I'm going to do that till I hit 180, then let it settle for a second and then add the dry hops, which are not the dry hops. That's for another video of the Whirlpool hops. And we'll discuss that very shortly. Well, just to follow. Oh, that literally just changed. It said it was 181 when I got my camera out, but I... Oh, what was I saying? Oh, just to follow up, I all I did was stir. I didn't do another pulse of the water. And I think that is my middle ground, I think. Just doing a one time, I don't know what that was. I can check the video. Let's say a, a 30 second run of water through and stir and then continue to stir. It drops to 180 in, I don't even think that was five minutes. So we're ready. Oh, look at that cold break. That is cool. That's really cool. I, the chemistry and science of brewing is absolutely amazing. But we're ready to whirlpool. And I, I took a nice uh, sample of the aroma again. Those Idaho gems. I have got to get more. I'm going to do something. I got to do a smash. I need to see what those bring to the party. But let's get in an ounce and a half. Whoop, that's nice camera work, man. Ounce and a half of hops. And I'm just going to stir this. For 15 minutes now, am I gonna stir this the whole 15 minutes? No, it's gonna be like two minutes, take a break, walk away, get some water, and that will be the routine for 15 minutes. But this is my Whirlpool method with the Anvil Foundry. It's not fancy, it's not glamorous, it's not exciting, and there's a big protein gunk hanging there. I try not to rip that off, I just wanna point out that I, I do see it. And uh, yeah, I love when I change subjects like that and I have no idea what I'm saying, but I'll be back when we're ready to cool down all this wort. We're at the end of the 15 minutes and I want a quick run through what happens next just for, was it posterity? So first thing I do, I just turn it completely off. So we're off. Actually, I guess that's the second thing I do. I, <laughs> I take the bug out of the water, not that it's gonna do anything if it actually gets in the line. I turned on my hose to get a water flow going and now I'm just gonna kick on the pump. In fact, let's just do it. Kick on the pump and I'm gonna stir this. So as I'm stirring, I'll talk about the whole temperature thing I was talking about with the water, meaning the groundwater going into that bucket. And with, again, us being at stay at home, uh, shelter in place, quarantine, yada, 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 whatever term your area is using, I don't really, I didn't initially want to run out and get some ice just for the sake of cooling my beer. So I guess it's in the frame of it's, this is not an invention. I was going to say necessity is the mother of invention. Maybe in the case necessity is the mother of trying something new. So what I do is my carboys, my better bottle, three gallon carboys are rated for 140 degrees. I chill this as low as I can with this, this chiller and that water. I get it to about 90 degrees. So then at 90 degrees, I put it in a carboy. Then I put it in my refrigerator, my beer refrigerator, and let it cool for another three or four hours, depending on what temperature I want. Usually within three to four hours, I get in the mid 60s. If I'm doing a lager, you know, I'll let it go another two hours to get into the 50s. And I have to, I don't know what I was expecting or good or bad, but I have had zero off flavors from that. So now not only is that getting me through quarantine, but that is how I'm gonna handle every beer that comes out of here because that's just one less thing I have to deal with. As you see, there is a cooler out here. That's where the big 20 and 10 pound bags of ice used to go. But I think I've, I, I don't know how many, how many, I do know how many beers I've done. One, two, three, four, five. This is my sixth beer. Five beers, no problem cooling it the way I just described it. And it saves me a little effort, a little time, and even a little money. I mean, bags of ice cost like four or five bucks. So 
Hey! There's something good came out of this, which quite a few things brewing wise have come out good of this. That's definitely one. So that is what I'm doing. I'm not gonna sit here and make you watch me cool this down to 90 degrees, but I will leave you saying that is where I'm going to pick up with my next step. We're at a temperature, I believe. Let's check. Oh, okay, you're at 87. We're well below 90. I'm ready to put this in a carboy and put it in a fridge. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I just sprayed the lid of this with sanitizer. So I'm gonna cap this off, rinse out my, not rinse out, I'm gonna pour the sanitizer out of my carboy and get this uh, going, which you're gonna see anyway. So here it comes. Now, before I get the transfer started from the foundry into the carboy, I just wanna show you that and you're probably thinking, man, it looks foamy. And it is foamy because, well, I was gonna say this, but actually technically this is the last of my star sand sanitizer. I have rationed it as much as I could. And instead of filling this from top to bottom, I filled it halfway and just shook it and shook it and shook it for over the past, I don't know, half hour to get that foam going to reach all the places that it could to sanitize the carboy and I am officially out of star sand. I do have an order out. Should be here by the end of the week. Hopefully I'll be able to brew next weekend. But right now, that is it. And that is what I did to maximize what I could of the sanitizer. So hopefully it was enough to uh, get all the nooks and crannies. Not that there's that many, but hopefully it was enough to hit all the contact points, the surface points. Because now I'm about to drain everything that's in there into this we are transferring and there is that color it's actually more yellow than i remember the last time i made this now i think except for the pilsner malt the malt the grist is exactly the same so the color regardless of the hops should have should be the same and they probably are i'm probably just remembering wrong but i am transferring it directly into well the carboy as you can see and you can see it's not crystal clear which is exactly what we're aiming for and that is where the flaked oats came in. But the yeast, more so, is going to play a big part in that as well. Did I say more so? Yeah, I did. I don't know if it's more so, the same, or less. I think there's only three options. Anyway, I am uh, just going to keep draining this until it don't drain no more. And then I'll be back. The well, transfer is done, as you can see. And I try to get three gallons to make up for the loss we're going to get in a fermenter between the uh, device I use to transfer now and the tube but we're a little short a quarter gallon and that's actually exactly right because if you've been following along which is again this time thing it's only been a few minutes for me but it's or for you but it's been much longer for me I did make that decision to extend the boil another half hour and that would accommodate for the quarter gallon loss because the foundry does about a half gallon per hour evaporation so that those numbers actually match perfectly so no surprise there i do have an airlock on that is for the cooling i'm going to replace that with a blow-off tube and all that is after yeast pitch which we may not get to this video because it's going to be another three four hours from now and i kind of want to see if i can get this video out for big brew day but maybe i'll follow up we shall see but uh there we go we got our well, it's still wart it's not beer until we get the yeast in it. And there it is in the fridge. So I'll check on it about three hours, see what the temperature is. There's the yeast I'm gonna pitch. That is a starter of uh, juice by Imperial. I think it's A38. It's Imperial juice. So uh, yeah, that'll be going in there. When this is down to the mid 60s, I'm gonna try to pull it out and pitch it about 64, best I can. I'm gonna take a surface area temperature and assume that the middle of all that wort is another two to three degrees higher so that's how i handle that and then into the fermentation chamber but i think that is it for this video except for a wrap up which i should probably go do outside i realized i do need to finish this outside because i need to take a reading on the refractometer so let's see how do i do this there's this is an iphone 11 i don't think it's a pro it has the three lenses i don't know which one to match it up to well, there we go all right we're shooting for one I gotta stand still. We're shooting for 155. You can see we've got one, it looks like 156 to me. Maybe 157 if you squint. But we got it with that extra half hour boil. So I think that was worth it. So now all I gotta do is clean up, which I've already done. Well, there's the baskets and stuff and some buckets and 
There's the spent grains. I just have to clean this, which is another nice thing. Well, all right, I have to clean the the unit. I have to clean the cooler and the spoon. I try, shouldn't have tried to point with that. That didn't work out as, as well at all. But it's a hell of a lot less than what I have to clean with the five gallon system, which is another reason I like this. So um, I think that's it. I do wanna mention, you can see, with the spoon a little bit. Can I scoop some up? Hard to do, but uh, well, you saw all the hot matter. I do empty this last wart into a bucket and pour it down to the garbage disposal because if you've seen any of the brew mutt in this video, you saw that she's half Doberman and Dobermans are super susceptible to the hop, the poisons in hop, or, or what's poisonous in hops to dogs. So I don't take any chances. In fact, is she still lamenting? No, they can only see my reflection. She was lamenting at the door that I, I lock her inside during this process so she doesn't accidentally lap up the sweet wart that's filled with dangerous hops. So, uh, yeah, I think that's all I have to share as far as brewing. And now I get to clean up, but I'll spare you that detail. Okay, I think that is everything. I wasn't really prepared to wrap up now, so let me do the usual, please. Subscribe. I am really trying to get to that number of subscribers that allows me to do live streams. And again, with this new Anvil Foundry focused thing, I think that's going to be a, a fun thing to do. So if you haven't already and you're watching this, please subscribe, like the video if you are so inclined, and leave any kind of comment. If you brewed for Big Brew Day, I'd love to know what you did and how it turned out. And I think with that, that is finally it. Again, an impromptu wrap up. I do have to say, of course, thank you for watching. And I'll be back again and I'll see you in the next episode.